but first thing, uh, thank you everyone for coming here. I know that there was a band. Thank you for all the volunteers who were able to come here much earlier and make this happen. So uh, my talk today is about the journey beyond the screen. Now typically I like starting my talks with some food. I feel like it gets everybody's attention really well. So today we're going to talk about this. This is a dish that my roommate and I tried out very recently. It's called an apple rose. Uh, in fact, a shout out to the audience. How many of you here enjoy cooking? A quick round. Oh wow, so many people. Awesome. So I think uh, for me cooking, I've always enjoyed the process of cooking. I think the whole idea of how recipes come together, where the idea of taking something like that from this to that and in, this, in the case of this, the recipe itself had too much thought that had gone into it. The apples need to be the right amount of thickness and the, it has to be rolled to the right level so that it's not too tight where there's no air going in but at the same time there's, it's not too loose where it opens up. And uh, I want to talk about one more recipe that has you, the, mo the same amount of thought that had gone into it as well. This is a recipe called uh, Riso Capio A Pepe. Uh, to talk about this recipe, let's go back a little bit. We're going to go back in Moderna 2012, where uh, there was a huge event that had happened that day. There were two magnitude 6 earthquakes that had hit and the epicenter was in, Mag was in Moderna. And this, of course, for all of you who have been in earthquakes or similar disasters, you know what, this, what happens when this, when this goes. There's a huge, huge loss. There's, everyone is scared. There's so, many, so much panic that's happening. And if that wasn't enough, there was a whole new problem that Moderna had. Moderna produces almost half the amount of Parmesan cheese in this world. And 360,000 barrels of those cheese was about to go to waste. This is not just a food waste problem anymore this would have meant a huge economic problem for Moderna. So, why am I talking about this? Well, the next thing I want to talk about is this chef, Massimo. So, Massimo is a three Michelin star chef. For this chef, it's not about just the food that he makes, it's about the power that the food has. He believes that as a cook, he's able to create recipes and put food together that creates memories and brings people together. And that is what he wanted to do now. He, he came to Moderna and he created the dish. He created uh, Riso Capio Pepe. It was a recipe that very interestingly used up this cheese. And the idea that he had was, he said, we're go I'm going to tell the story of Moderna and we're going to have a dinner all over the world where we're going to cook this dish and we're going to talk about the story and we're going to sell out all of the, uh, all of the cheese so nobody has to lose their business. And that's what happened. 40,000 people across the whole world made this one dinner. In fact, Forbes talks about that even now. They said it was one of the biggest Italian dinners in history. Thanks to this one simple recipe, he was able to save the city of Modena. And this day is still, is still celebrated each year. So, Massimo talks about this dish as a recipe for, as a social gesture. Because you see, when Massimo was coming up with this recipe, he didn't just think about how would this food taste like. He thought about much bigger aspects. He was thinking of the economy of the country, of the of Moderna and how something as simple as his recipe could impact something like that. And uh, as designers, I think we have a lot to take from this story because as designers, we too create smaller pieces of work which goes in and has, uh, has the capability of in impacting much bigger places. To make my point, I'm going to play a small clip from one of my favorite shows. Uh, and in fact, for anybody else who wants to read more about this, you could go watch the first episode of Chef's Table. Make a right turn. Wait, 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 no, 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 no. It means bear right. No. Up there. It said right, so take a right. No, 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 look. It, it means go up to the right, bear right, over the bridge, and hook up with 307. Make a right Maybe turn. Maybe it's a shortcut, Dwight. It said go to the right. It can't mean that. There's what, a what lake there. I think it knows where it is going. This is the, the machine knows. This is the lake. Stop yelling at me. No, it's Stop not yelling. yelling. There's no lake. The machine knows. Well, I know we would probably didn't drive our cars into lakes, but you get what I'm trying to say. Technology and the products we design have embedded themselves into our lives. Right from when we wake up to when we go to sleep, we're constantly moving from one product to another. And this comes at a cost. While Google Maps has changed the way we navigate our, our cities, uh, they, they, it also has done a lot more than that. In fact, I was planning to keep some stats and create some, uh, create some stats to give an idea of how much technology is impacting us, but I realized I don't think I need to. I think we're all qu quite aware of the role that technology and these products play in our lives. How many of you have played this game? 
or have heard of this game right i remember i played this game so much time until it was taken down a game that was taken down because it was too addicted addictive in fact the owner of this game received death threats from families saying that please take this game down because people are not able to stop playing it but but you can't really do that right we can't start taking things down that are not working so there there are some companies that are trying to do their bit of trying to solve for addiction and trying to solve for things like this but because uh, i believe that design can do a lot more right in fact this is a great example headspace where they're able to make a product a, sm a simple few elements on a screen is able to combat such complicated issues like depression and anxiety so design has the power to do a lot more if you go back to masimo's story when masimo was coming up with the dish of this recipe he didn't just think about the immediate aspects he didn't just think about things like the serving size taste the common things that most people think about when they make that make make a recipe he was able to zoom out and think about a lot bigger aspects he he thought about the economy of the the place at that time supporting the local cheese makers the city's food waste and if i were to reflect this with designers i feel like there's a lot of resemblance here as designers we have immediate things that we look at things like the interface things like usability accessibility aesthetics but we also have much bigger aspects that we we don't always consider things like behaviors what what are the behaviors that our products are driving what are, what about branding what about habits and policies even sustainability that's a whole different topic so as designers how do we start thinking going from immediate aspects to start looking at more long term aspects a, a great analogy that i like to use to explain how we do this is the iceberg model so the uh, the way the iceberg model works is you have parts of the iceberg that are visible and parts that are not similarly even for us we need to uh, understand how do we go from the visible to the invisible let me relate this to design so for us when we talk about visible we're talking about touch points these are things that are tangible the things that we're most probably designing this could be the a restaurant homepage a menu these are things that you can touch you can see you design them a lot of uh, the, a lot of what, what we do falls under this cat category then you have experiences these are the way that users navigate through multiple touch points to achieve the goal that they want so for example attending a conference is a uh, is an experience another ex another example is uh, ordering food dining out all of these are examples of experiences that we go through and then finally we have systems these are the overall ecosystems and the scenarios in which these touch points and journeys exist these give structure and logic to why experiences and touch points work the way that they do for example in the case of ordering food a system that you might want to look at is how the entire food supply works now so the idea that you need to look at is the next time you're looking at touch points and you're designing these touch points try to go deeper try to think about not just the parts that are visible try to go a little bit beyond that try to find the parts that are invisible try to find surface problems that you might not directly see let's talk a little bit more about how how we could do this this is a user journey map how many of you have heard of this or used this in your work lot lot of us uh So, so while we talk about user journeys uh, the way that it typically works is you have a user you have all these actions each action is probably related to an to a specific touch point now what if i told you that the user journeys we create are actually incomplete because while we call them user journeys we most often just refer to them as we just call the user as the end user or the customer but if i were to go in to what could this user look like there are actually a lot more so if you so of course you have the end user we are we are aware of this uh so if i were to look at a scenario of ordering food while it's me the end user who's ordering food there are a lot of people who influence my decision of doing so for example my roommate there have been so many times where i'm just working minding my own business and my roommate would come out and he's ordering something from corner house if you're not been to corner house you should and he's like hey should i add some more for you as well and it's been really tempting so uh, also the delivery apps there have been so many times where i get a pop up saying 30% off on this ice cream that i know you like so, so so what i'm trying to say is there are immediate and direct stakeholders apart from the end user who influence these decisions there are also indirect users people like the farmer people like the food suppliers the stores the people who are indirect stakeholders and understanding this gives you a much better idea of what 
what are the main decisions and behaviors that drive ordering food? This is called a stakeholder map. It helps you understand the relationship between different direct and indirect stakeholders. So the next time you're going and looking at mapping your user journeys, let's bring all of these people out. And in fact, let's map their journeys as well. Let's map their journeys along with the, user, uh, the end user journeys and try to really understand what would this, what would this mean for what we're trying to design. Because in doing so, you're able to much, get a much better grasp of what you're trying to do. Now, let's look at some examples because that always, that always helps bring some more uh, idea on this. The first one is by Click Health. Uh, this is a ecosystem, healthcare ecosystem. What I really like about this is they didn't just stop at mapping the different users. They've also gone beyond that and started mapping their touch points. Doing this helped them understand what are the different common areas that are, that are being used. What are who, which, which user uses technology, which users actually don't use technology. With things like brochures or certain policy documents are not digital. So uh, it gives you a much better holistic understanding of what touch points each users have access to. Another great example is organizing an event. This is by UX Booth. Uh, what I really like about is this part of it. What they've done is they've created a, a journey and they are mapping out the activities that happen inside the app and outside the app. And what that difference does is it was able to help them surface insights that uh, things like the organizing and planning that happens around an event, right? Thing or sharing, if sh sharing pictures or even collaboration and networking outside of the event. Doing these, ma making maps like this helps them really understand what are the opportunities we can look for that are not just limited to the app, but even outside that. Uh, this is a great example by Anna Soto. Uh, for those of you who want to have some really cool service design references, definitely look her work up. They look really, I mean, one thing I really like about this is how visually aesthetic it is. It reminds us that our work, even though however complex, doesn't have to look boring, it can look really interesting as well. This is a journey she designed of a family going through a Walt Disney uh, park. And what I like is she's actually seg segregated the different people in the family and mapped each of their journeys separately. And doing that helped her understand and find opportunities for almost like micro experiences within these different areas for her to start putting them together. Here's another one where they've mapped the entire customer journey, all the touch points that have that come in at every step and all the different people and, the, and when they're able to, when, when they're involved. Doing this helps you understand how do your employees actually work together. Like do, how often does the legal team and design team actually have to work together and realizing that, okay, there are actually a lot of overlaps between the design and the legal team. So maybe we just start putting them together more often. This is an, another example from something that I was working on a few years back. This is in the realm of sustainable, uh, sustainable real estate. Uh, that's me on the top left, or my reflection at least. Uh, I was really happy when I took this picture because while all of these people have been working in this company for over four or five years, they've never sat in the same room together. And it was really interesting to see all of these people come together. That's the blueprint, a service blueprint that we had when we were showing all of them. And uh, what we were trying to do is really make everybody understand where their role falls, on, falls in. Uh, another thing we did was to also create a really good illustration. Uh, I had a friend of mine called Gotham help me create this illustration where we mapped out the same journey, but instead of looking at it as a table, it now is an actual journey. And the funny thing is the caricatures are actually the people in the company. And uh, it was really interesting to see some of these people walk by and look at their own caricature. Uh, I remember this one story of somebody from the construction team, somebody who's never really involved in customer experience discussions, now is seeing their own caricature and that somehow changes something. It makes them feel like they're part of it, right? Because everybody at the end of the day works together and that's how systems work. So let's, let's, let's recap. There's a lot of things that we went through. Now, I wanted to again put a lot of slides recapping everything, but I wanted to borrow another clip from a really famous movie that will help me recap what I've just said. Perfect! Mind taking that stick of yours and draw me a map up? Oh, hey! To find it, you must look beyond what you see. What the heck is that supposed to mean? It means look beyond what you see. Beyond what I see. So, so if I had to give you just one takeaway from my talk, this would be it. Is to look beyond what you can see. Because if you can look beyond what is visible and try to find problems and areas that are underlying aspects of that visibility, 
if you're able to go much beyond your user and try to find out all the different people who are involved, you can really create experiences that start to matter a lot more. You're able to create a much bigger impact. And to end with Mahatma Gandhi's quote, where he said the difference between what we do and what we're capable of doing would suffice for most of the world's problems. And I truly believe that as designers, if we're able to look beyond and design much more impactful work, one screen at a time, we're able, I think we can leave this world a little better than we found it. Thank you.